You know, why does that propagation occur? Why do we have a wave-like behavior? Uh, it's really related to two uh, important effects. Um, two important properties of the acoustic fluid, which is inertia and a compressibility. And in fact, the propagation uh, occurs uh, exactly like the, the hola in a, a stadium. Uh, you have one person standing up and the person on his left stands up with a certain delay and then the second person to the left stands up with also a delay and finally the, the, the wave goes all around the stadium. Um, it is important to, to notice that what is moving is not a, somebody, is not a person moving, each spectator, each participant to the hola has a vertical movement, goes up and down, but doesn't move around the stadium. It's going to be the same for an acoustic wave. The air particles are locally moving, but they are not uh, moving uh, with the wave. It's only the, the information about the movement that travels. It's only some kind of energy that uh, travels. Um, if you look at this uh, animation, um, you clearly see that. You see indeed if you follow the uh, black dots uh, that something seems to be moving, which is uh, the wave, but if you look at one individual, let's say, molecule of air, the red one for instance, you see that uh, it is only moving back and forth locally, exactly like the uh, person in the stadium moves up and down and then sits uh, again. Let's look a little bit closer. In this diagram, uh, you see a certain number of air molecules, let's say, or um, which are connected by more air, which acts in fact like a spring between the air molecule that we have singled out. And on the left side, you have this little green device that represents a piston. So you have a piston at one end of a duct, and we have singled out a certain number of molecules uh, in the uh, of air molecules in the duct. So uh, at the first instance, uh, all molecules are at their rest uh, position, and the piston is not yet moving. It is also at its its rest. Uh, position. If we go one step later, the piston has moved to the right and is pushing the air molecule that is in contact with the piston. The air between the first and the second molecule is compressed, but because it has some compressibility, um, it is uh, the pressure has increased and it is pushing on the second uh, molecule. But the molecule has a certain inertia and so has not yet started moving. All the energy, let's say, is stored as deformation energy in the spring that connects the two uh, little uh, air masses. Um, in the third step, the piston has moved further to the right. The pressure uh, and, and the force acting on the second a molecule is strong enough to force it to uh, start moving and by moving it creates a force that acts on the third molecule. Now the piston starts pulling back, the first a molecule is coming back, the spring between molecule 1 and molecule 2 is elongated, it starts pulling on uh, the, the second molecule, but, but because the molecule has inertia, it keeps its movement to the right, keeps on pushing on the third molecule, which now starts to move uh, as well. The pistons keep pulling back, the force acting on the second molecule, trying to push it to move also to the left, is now strong enough, so the movement has started on the left, the spring between the second and third molecule is elongated but and the fourth molecule has started moving. So I will not comment every step, 
but you see basically that uh, while the piston at the first mass is following a sign uh, trajectory, a sign movement, uh, well, the other molecules further down the duct also follow the same uh, sign movement, but each time with some kind of delay. And if there is a distance delta x between the molecules we have singled out in the duct, well, there will be a time delay in the movement and the ratio of delta x over delta t defines the speed of sound. This very simple model shows also that the speed of sound is the result of a balance between two properties of the fluid, its inertia and its compressibility. Inertia is related to the mass. The heavier the fluid, the higher the density of the fluid, the more force it will take to place it in a given state of motion. So for a given acceleration, the force that needs to be applied is proportional to the mass. So if you have a heavy fluid, you will need a high pressure exerted from one mass on the next to set it in motion. The second aspect is compressibility. And in compressibility, we have to be cautious about the words that we use. Because when we say that the fluid is highly compressible, in fact, we mean that it has a very low compressibility modulus. Because the compressibility modulus in physics is defined like Young's modulus, which means that uh, a very high, highly compressible fluid is easily compressible and has a very low compressibility modulus. Now what is the effect of the compressibility modulus is that for a given displacement of one of the mass, the pressure that will act on the next mass will depend on the compressibility. If the compressibility is low, you will need a large movement of one particle to get a large pressure on the other one. And so you see that all things being equal, uh, a fluid that, <coughs> that is highly compressible will have a lower speed of sound. So the two effects play in opposite directions. Now we can take a different look. Instead of uh, looking like here to the position of the different individual molecules uh, over time, we may look at their posi the position of all the molecules at one given time. Uh, but because the, the movement is horizontal, this is not very practical. So we're going to try to represent the horizontal movement on a vertical scale. And if you do that, you see that at any given instant, the uh, horizontal movement of the particle is also distributed sinusoidally, And that uh, corresponding to the time period of the movement of the piston, we have a sort of spatial periodicity in the displacement, which is the definition of the wavelength. So there is periodicity of the source, piston movement in the time domain, but we observe also a periodicity in space and the wavelengths and the period are connected by the speed of sound. Lambda is equal to C times T. It may be a good occasion to remind you of uh, a set of very important formulas that we are going to use over and over and which are common to all fields of uh, all field of physics involving waves. We have a number of indicators uh, representing uh, the signal and the wave, the frequency, the period, the wavelength, the wave number, the pulsation, the speed of sound, and they are all closely connected. Um, if you hesitate in any of these formula, please think in terms of units. Um, lambda is a length, and a length is indeed the speed divided by a frequency. 
or a frequency is hertz. So it's a number of cycles per second. So it's one over time, it's one over period. And just remember that omega, the pulsation, and k, the wave number, involve a 2 pi uh, factor.